This may look like an ordinary cactus, a small houseplant that you water once a month and never think twice about. But this is no ordinary succulent. This is Euphorbia resinifer, also known as the African resin spurge. And while it may seem ordinary at first glance, this plant holds a very extraordinary secret. Just beneath its skin, there is a milky white liquid known as latex, and that latex contains resinifera toxin, the spiciest chemical known to man. On the Scoville scale, it is over 1,000 times more potent than pure capsaicin, the chemical found in hot chili peppers. No record exists of a human tasting this substance. Until today. A few months ago, I ate a Carolina Reaper pepper for the first time, and it was pretty hot. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so I only tasted a small piece, but it was still enough to make my whole throat burn for a few minutes. It was pretty intense, but it made me wonder, was this as bad as it could get, or was there something else out there that was even higher than a Carolina Reaper? The answer, yes and no. No, there is no edible plant currently on the market that tops this pepper in spiciness. But yes, there are definitely spicier substances. While the Carolina Reaper is about a 2 million on the Scoville scale, pure capsaicin is around 16 million. That's pretty hot. But I needed to know, was there anything higher on the Scoville scale than pure capsaicin? Since you're watching this video, you know the answer is obviously yes. As of 2020, resin toxin is the highest rated substance on the Scoville scale, clocking in at an insane rating of 16 billion, roughly 1,000 times hotter than pure capsaicin and some suspect that it could be even stronger. When I learned this, I was kind of blown away, but I didn't really think much of it. That is, of course, until two YouTubers rekindled my interest in spicy chemistry. The first was Nal Red, who recently posted a video in which he synthesized Nordihydrocapsaicin for his own hot sauce. I thought his video was a real masterpiece, and I really recommend you go check it out for yourself. The second YouTuber I'll mention is known as Thizoid Laboratories. The creator behind this channel recently released a community post stating that he would be attempting to synthesize phenylacyl rinvanil, a compound that ranks a solid 4.5 billion on the Scoville scale, if my sources are correct. After seeing that post, I thought it might be fun to make a spicy video of my own. Of course, the competitive side of me also in whatever I made to be the most absolute insane thing possible. I knew that resinifera toxin was supposed to be the spiciest substance on God's green earth, so logically, that was my first choice. I also knew that the resin spurge plant was an amazing natural source of this potent chemical, so I absentmindedly looked it up on eBay one morning. Much to my delight and surprise, it turned out that I could buy three cuts of it for under 25 bucks. Needless to say, I bought the plant on the spot. I'll take 10! And while I waited for my precious package to arrive, I did a ton of research to get an idea of how exactly to go about this extraction. In the end, I only found one paper that specifically talked about extracting resinifer toxin from resin spurge. According to the paper, the latex from the plant is first treated with methanol, dried, and then extracted overnight with a mixture of methanol, water, and petroleum ether. The lower methanol water phase is then evaporated down and sent through a Craig countercurrent distribution setup, which is basically a complex series of separatory funnels that utilizes the same methanol water petroleum ether mixture as before to further separate the diterpenes. The methanol layers are next combined and sent through another countercurrent distribution array, this time with carbon tetrachloride instead of petroleum ether. And to finish it all off, column chromatography and thin layer chromatography are employed to separate the individual compounds. Now, if your mind is somehow still intact after hearing all that, you may be wondering how I was able to replicate this procedure at home with the budget of a broke college student. Well, let me just show you. For this procedure, I utilized the following ingredients. Three cuts of resin spurge, water, methanol, ethanol, diethyl ether, concentrated sulfuric acid, a liter or two of gasoline, several packs of artificially flavored vanilla sugar, and unscented silica gel cat litter. Let's do this. The first thing I had to do was get the latex out of the resin spurge. To do this, I started by filling up a beaker with 100 milliliters of warm methanol. Then, with slow stirring, I started to cut up the resin spurge. Some of the milky white latex dripped into the methanol as I sliced the plant, but overall, not much came out. So once everything was cut up, I washed the remaining plant material with about 50 more milliliters of methanol, and allowed everything to soak for at least an hour. After an hour had elapsed, I added the methanol from the plant washings to the primary methanol solution. This combined solution should have contained most of the resinifera toxin, along with other diterpene esters, undissolved latex polymers, and plant material. However, excess water was also present from the plant material, and I wanted to remove most of it to help more RTX dissolve. So I set up a simple distillation and to still have as much of the liquid as possible. I didn't boil to absolute dryness though, since I feared the product would degrade if heated too strongly. After boiling down, I added about 100 milliliters of fresh methanol to the concentrated mixture, along with 100 milliliters of petroleum ether. 
I got my petroleum ether by distilling several liters of gasoline, collecting everything that came over below 70C, and then water washing the distillate to remove the ethanol. This ether was shaken together with the methanol solution and the layers were allowed to separate. Now at this point, I ran into a slight bump. You see, the paper called for a mixture of roughly 25 parts methanol, 37 parts petroleum ether, and 1 part water by volume, and that was supposed to be added to a mostly water-free latex residue that was dried under vacuum after azeotropic distillation with ethanol. Needless to say, I deviated from the paper a little bit here. Based on my boiling point readings, the boiled down latex solution I had here was mostly water. And as mentioned before, I didn't want to cook it down much further since I was worried about the product decomposing. So what did I do? I added another 100, no, 200 milliliters of methanol to the solution in hopes that it would increase the solubility of my product to the appropriate level. Instead of fixing a problem which may not have needed fixing, this blender presented a new issue. All of the petroleum ether was now able to dissolve into the methanol layer. After panicking slightly, I realized there was a simple solution dumping in more petroleum ether. Thankfully, this actually worked, and after adding most of my remaining petroleum ether, I was once again left with two distinct layers. So I mixed everything together thoroughly one last time and left it overnight. The next day, I filtered off the solids and rinsed the filter paper with a small amount of methanol. The product should have remained in the lower methanol water phase, and my next step was to isolate it. To do this, I simply load the solution into a separatory funnel, drain the lower layer into a 500 milliliter round bomb flask, and set about distilling off the solvent. When most of the solvent had been removed, I lifted the flask off the hot plate to help prevent burning and proceeded to pull a vacuum. This helped pull off most of the remaining solvent, which should have been mostly water and maybe some heavier hydrocarbons. I did this until the product seemed solvent free, and then I used a small amount of methanol to transfer everything into a 4 gram vial. After evaporating the methanol with the help of my hot plate, I was left with a few milliliters of this sticky, dark red liquid. The red color is possibly due to beta carotene, but could also be caramelizing sugar left over from the plant material. And indeed, this stuff did have a slightly sweet vegetable-like smell, kind of like cooked carrots. But anyways, I next dissolved the thick red liquid in a minimal amount of methanol and loaded it into a burette that I'd filled with silica gel, which I got for blending up unscented crystal kitty litter. This was supposed to be a calm chromatography run, but I ran into a few issues and ended up getting fairly poor separation of the diterpene esters. If I had more petroleum ether at the time, I would have done a proper gradient elution to get better separation, but I didn't, so I just ran the column with straight methanol. This still helped separate some of the more polar impurities though, and it gave a pretty nice color show in the process. I let everything filter through the silica gel for several hours, pausing only after nightfall, and in the end, I had several vials full of eluent. I didn't want to deal with another distillation, so this time I just poured everything into a beaker and boiled off most of the methanol. Once very little was left in the beaker, I transferred the remaining solution into a small vial, where I continued concentrating it. Close to the end, I decided to take a risk and add a little bit of water to the mixture. Even though none of the papers I read mentioned this as a step, I knew resenifer toxin was highly insoluble in water, and I figured that doing this would help knock the product out of solution. Much to my delight, it turned out that I was right. After boiling the aqueous solution further to remove the last bit of methanol, I was left with a dark green oil floating on the surface. I quickly chilled the solution to help drop out any remaining oil, and then I poured off as much of the red aqueous layer as possible. Then, diethyl ether was used to wash the last bits of oil out of the aqueous phase. The ether washings were combined with the green oil in the initial vial, and the ether was gently boiled off. In the end, I was left with two vials, one with the red aqueous solution and one with a small amount of green waxy solid. If all went well, the vial with the green substance should have contained the purified resinifer toxin. However, I wanted to know for sure, so I set up a test to see if resinifer toxin was truly present in my sample. To do this, I utilized a stain made by mixing 0.54 grams of vanillin with 0.1 milliliters of sulfuric acid and 9 milliliters of ethanol. For those interested, I extracted my 0.54 grams of vanillin from the aforementioned 12 packets of vanilla sugar using methanol and recrystallized it using hot water. According to the paper, resinifer toxin and its derivatives should stain black, while almost everything else should stain some shade of blue, orange, or brown. Upon mixing the stain with my sample, nothing really happened. However, according to some other resources I looked at, the stain must be gently heated to work. So I set the sample over my hot plate and brought the temperature up to around 60 degrees. And, like magic, my sample slowly darkened and turned an undeniable black color. The resinifer toxin had been isolated. At this point, I could have just said mission accomplished and went on my merry way, but we all know that wasn't the plan. So as soon as I confirmed that I had resinifer toxin, I knew exactly what I had to do. Alright. The extraction is completed, and now it's time for the moment you've all been waiting for. Tasting. Uh, but before we taste the actual resinifer toxin, I figured it'd be a good idea to taste something that I bit think most people are a bit more acquainted with. Habanero pepper.
this will be just a comparison to see how ordinary capsaicin is compared to resiniferotoxin. So, I guess now I just have to eat it. There we go. So, one of the first things you notice whenever you eat something spicy like a habanero, oh God. the pain is almost immediate. <laughs> I know water isn't going to help, but <sighs> the pain is almost immediate. It sets in very quickly but also kind of peaks very quickly. It heats a peak and then it somewhat quickly goes back down. At this point the pain is going away pretty quickly and it's only been like 30 seconds, a minute. It was very hot, but is the world's spiciest substance hotter? I'm gonna give my mouth a minute to cool down and I will check back with you. All right, it has been roughly 15 minutes since I ate the habanero pepper, and all of the heat from it is completely gone from my mouth, so I have a clean palate for the spiciest substance in the known universe. This is a pretty sizable drop of resinifera toxin. You probably can't see it very well from there, but uh, it's actually a very nice olive green color probably from the plant material that's still inevitably left in it. So, here it goes, tasting the spiciest substance in the world. So one of the first things you notice whenever you're tasting resinifera toxin is it has a Kind of incubation period. Whenever you first get it on your tongue, you don't really feel much of anything. The only thing I can really taste is the kind of bad planty taste from the plant material that's still left in it. But as time goes on, after say, I think it's been like three minutes now, it does finally start to kick in and it just kind of builds and builds and builds. It's still building right now. It's quite impressive. <laughs> I didn't swallow any of it because I do not know what the exact effects are if you do swallow it and get it in your digestive tract. So I just left it on my tongue for probably half a minute. I switched some water, I spat it out. Even though it is ranked 16 billion on the Scoville scale, the heat I'm experiencing right now is not nearly comparable to the habanero pepper. Hold on, what? I'll admit, this stuff is hot, but according to the wisdom of the internet, my reaction should have been more like this. But that's obviously not the case. So what gives? Well, unlike hot peppers like the Carolina Reaper, the Resin Spurge isn't absolutely pumped full of its spicy component. The researchers who did this extraction professionally only obtained 200 milligrams or so of RTX from a 77 gram sample of dried resin. That's not a lot. And since I failed to properly utilize chromatography to completely isolate the resinifera toxin, the material I tasted was heavily contaminated. At best, this stuff is only 10% RTX, and it's probably less than that because I did fewer extractions and washings than the research team. Also, according to some sources, resinifera toxin is sensitive to oxidation and possibly photodegradation, so my lengthy extraction without an inert atmosphere probably also resulted in some product decomposition. Still, while this stuff isn't pure, it does contain non-negligible levels of resinifera toxin. The Van Lin stain test helps confirm this, and so does the spiciness. In theory though, it still should have been at least as hot as a habanero, even if only one part out of 100,000 was resinifera toxin. So why am I not in tears, or worse, in the emergency room? To find out, let's look at what we know about resinifera toxin. Resinifera toxin is a diterpene ester in the daphnine family of chemicals, and at room temperature, it should theoretically be a white, waxy solid similar to capsaicin. In fact, this compound is similar to capsaicin in quite a few ways as both molecules are composed of a vanilloid group attached to a larger organic structure. 
Vanilloids are what trigger your body's heat receptors, so many molecules with this group tend to cause burning sensations upon exposure. Resinifer toxin triggers these receptors quite strongly, so strongly in fact that it tends to keep them stimulated until they overload and desensitize. This behavior helps explain why the burning sensation lasts for such a long time compared to ordinary capsaicin. Now, to explain the initial delay before the spiciness hits, let's take a look at this scientific paper written back in 1997. It states, since RTX is a bulkier and more lipophilic molecule than capsaicin, its tissue penetration rate is presumably much slower. As follows, capsaicin is likely to penetrate the receptors rapidly and occupy the receptor-linked channels almost simultaneously, whereas RTX probably occupies these vanilloid receptors in a gradual manner. Such hermosoconnect differences may predominate upon topical application, providing a rational explanation why RTX given intraocularly has an unexpectedly poor potency to provoke the chemogenetic pain response. Later on, the paper also states that resinifer toxin is ultra-potent, but relatively less pungent than capsaicin. Pungency is, of course, a reference to spiciness. So, after all this, you may be wondering how the substance that tops the Scoville scale could potentially be less spicy than plain old capsaicin. Well, it all comes down to the Scoville scale itself. The Scoville scale isn't necessarily the amount of pain that it causes you. The Scoville scale works based on how little of it it takes for you to detect it. So even though resinifer toxin isn't causing me nearly as much pain as capsaicin or capsaicin-based plants or products, in theory, I should be able to dilute it to a very, very small amount and still be able to detect it. Apparently, a thousand times more dilute than capsaicin. So, was resinifer toxin the world-ending spicy chemical we all thought it would be? It's kind of hard to say, honestly. We know for a fact that this does contain resinifer toxin, and I did in fact taste it. The question is, how much of it is resinifer toxin? That's up for debate. It's entirely possible that resinifer toxin is not as spicy as capsaicin. That's been brought up in the paper that I read. Uh, but it's also possible that this is just so dilute that I'm not getting the full effect of it. So until I can taste resinifer toxin in its purest form, I can't say whether or not it is stronger than capsaicin when it comes to the spicy feeling you get in your mouth. So there you have it isolating and tasting the spiciest substance in the known universe, resinifer toxin. Thank you all very much for watching. I had a great time making this video, and I hope you all learned something in the process. If you like what you see, consider donating or becoming my patron on Patreon. The links, as always, are down below. And if you join my Patreon soon, you might just win a cool little prize. I'll be giving away this ampule sample of resinifer toxin and methanol to one of my patrons in the coming month. It's a pretty neat collector's piece, and it could be yours for the same price as a cup of coffee. Quite the bargain when you consider the ludicrous cost of refined resinifer for a toxin. Remember to like, share, and subscribe if you want to see more of my content, and click the bell if you want to know whenever I'm uploading. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Lab Coats out.